many alternative stories to the sinking of the ocean liner Titanic have been put forward. The accepted reason for the sinking, which resulted in the death of 1,517 passengers and crew, is that the ship struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on April 14, 1912, buckling the hull plates allowing water to enter the ship's first five watertight compartments, which resulted in her sinking two hours and 40 minutes later. Hypotheses which have been suggested as the cause of the disaster include unsafe speed, an insurance scam, an ice pack rather than an iceberg, and even a curse on the ship by the unlucky mummy. Further theories arose after a journalist had a heart attack whilst on board the 2012 commemorative cruise that followed the same journey 100 years later. Pack Ice, in 2003, Captain L. M. Collins, a former member of the Ice Pilotage Service, published The Sinking of the Titanic, the mystery solved proposing, based upon his own experience of ice navigation and witness statements given at the two post-disaster inquiries, that what the Titanic hit was not an iceberg but low-lying pack ice. He based his conclusion upon three main pieces of evidence. At 11.30 p.m. on the night of the sinking, the two lookouts spotted what they believed to be haze on the horizon, extending approximately 20 a degree on either side of the ship's bow, despite there being no other reports of haze at any time. Collins believes that what they saw was not haze but a strip of pack ice, three a euro four miles ahead of the ship. The ice was variously reported as 60 feet high by the lookouts, 100 feet high by quartermaster row on the port deck, and only very low in the water by 4th officer Boxall, on the starboard side near the darkened bridge. Collins believes that this was due to an optical phenomenon that is well known to ice navigators where the flat sea and extreme cold distort the appearance of objects near the water line, making them appear to be the height of the ship's lights about 60 feet above the surface near the bow, and 100 feet high alongside the superstructure. A ship such as the Titanic turned by pivoting about a point approximately a third of the ship's length from the bow, with the result that with her rather hard over, she could not have avoided crushing her entire starboard side into an iceberg for such a collision to occur, with the result that the hull and possibly the superstructure on the starboard side would have been rent. In all probability, the ship would have flooded, capsized, and sunk within minutes. Coal Fire, Ohio State University engineer Robert S. and High released a theory in November 2004 that claims a coal fire led indirectly to the iceberg collision. He claims a pile of stored coal had started to smolder, to get control over that situation, more coal was put into the furnaces, leading to unsafe speeds in the iceberg-laden waters. Essen High states that records prove that fire control teams were on standby at the ports of Cherbourg and Southampton because of a fire in the stockpile, and that such fires are known to reignite after they have been supposedly extinguished. He suggests that the Titanic actually set off from Southampton with one of its bunkers on fire, or that a spontaneous combustion of coal occurred after the ship left port. Such fires were a common phenomenon aboard coal-fired ships and one of many reasons why marine transportation switched to oil in the early 1900s. It is similarly theorized that such a bunker fire was responsible for the explosion of the USS Maine in 1898, by setting off her powder magazines. Gardner's ship that never sank, one of the most controversial and complex theories was put forward by Robin Gardner in his book, Titanic, The Ship That Never Sank. In it, Gardner draws on several events and coincidences that occurred in the months, days, and hours leading up to the sinking of the Titanic, and concludes that the ship that sank was in fact Titanic a Euro a Euro a Euro a sister ship Olympic, disguised as Titanic, as an insurance scam by her owners, the International Mercantile Marine Group, controlled by American financier J.P. Morgan that had acquired the White Star Line in 1902. Olympic was the slightly older sister of Titanic, built alongside the more famous vessel but launched in October 1910. Her exterior profile was nearly identical to Titanic, save for minor details such as the number of portholes on the Ford C decks of the ships, the spacing of the windows on the B decks, and the Ford section of the A deck promenade on Titanic that had been enclosed only a few weeks before she set sail on her ill-fated maiden voyage. This may have been done to give her a slightly different appearance to increase the illusion that Titanic was really a new ship. 
Both ships were built with linoleum floors, but shortly before she was due to set sail J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line, inexplicably ordered the floors aboard Titanic carpeted over. This could have been done to cover up the worn linoleum floors on the slightly older Olympic which by then had her name plate switched to become Titanic to give her the appearance of a brand new ship. On September 20, 1911, the Olympic was involved in a collision with the Royal Navy warship HMS Hawk in the Brambles Channel in Southampton Water. The two ships were close enough to each other that Olympic's motion drew the Hawk into her aft starboard side, causing extensive damage to the liner a Euro both above and below its waterline. An admiralty inquiry assigned blame to the Olympic, despite numerous eyewitness accounts to the contrary. Gardner's theory plays out in this historical context. Olympic was found to be at blame in the collision. Because of this finding, White Star's insurers Lloyds of London allegedly refused to pay out on the claim. White Star's flagship would also be out of action during the extensive repairs and the Titanic a Euro a Euro show Euro s completion date, which was already behind schedule due to Olympic a Euro a Euro show Euro s return to the yard after her loss of a propeller blade, would have to be delayed. All this would amount to a serious financial loss for the company. Gardner proposes that, to make sure at least one vessel would be earning money, the badly damaged Olympic was patched up and then converted to become the Titanic. The real Titanic when complete would then quietly enter service as the Olympic. The Titanic indeed had a slight list to port leaving Southampton. Inadequate trimming of cargo and bunkers would likely result in such and the crew seems to have demonstrated a lack of proficiency on several occasions. A list to port was noted by several Titanic survivors including Lawrence Beasley who wrote in his book about the sinking, I then called the attention of our table to the way the Titanic listed to port and we watched the skyline through the portholes as we sat at the purser's table in the saloon. This was echoed by survivor Norman Chambers, who testified that after the collision, however, there was then a slight list to starboard, with probably a few degrees in pitch. And as the ship had a list to port nearly all afternoon, I decided to remain up. Gardner states that few parts of either ship bore the name, other than the easily removed lifeboats, bell, compass binnacle, and name plates. Everything else was standard White Star issue and was interchangeable between the two ships, and other vessels in the White Star fleet. While all other White Star Line ships had their name engraved into the hull, the Titanic alone had its name riveted over top. In recent pictures of the wreck depicting a spot where two riveted plates that had spelled Titanic fell off, the letters MP appear to be stamped into the hull. The plan, Gardner suggests was to dispose of the Olympic, which had allegedly been damaged beyond economic repair in a way that would allow White Star to collect the full insured value of a brand new ship. He supposes that the seacocks were to be opened at sea to slowly flood the ship. If numerous ships were stationed nearby to take off the passengers, the shortage of lifeboats would not matter as the ship would sink slowly and the boats could make several trips to the rescuers. Gardner uses as evidence the length of Titanic a Euro a Euro show Euro SC trials. Olympic a Euro a Euro show Euro S trials in 1910 took two days, including several high speed runs, but Titanic a Euro a Euro show Euro S trials reportedly only lasted for one day, with no working over half speed. Gardner says this was because the patched up hull could not take any long periods of high speed. Perhaps this was due to the fact that Titanic as a nearly identical twin sister of the Olympic was expected to handle exactly the same, or perhaps the Board of Trade inspectors were in on the scheme. Gardner maintains that on April 14, First Officer Murdoch was on the bridge because he was one of the few high-ranking officers other than Captain Smith who knew of the plan and was keeping a watch out for the rescue ships. One of Gardner's most controversial statements is that the Titanic did not strike an iceberg, but an IMM rescue ship that was drifting on station with its lights out. Gardner based this hypothesis on the idea that the supposed iceberg was seen at such a short distance by the lookouts on the Titanic because it was actually a darkened ship, and he also does not believe an iceberg could inflict such sustained and serious damage to a steel double-hulled vessel such as the Titanic. Gardner further hypothesizes that the ship that was hit by the Titanic was the one seen by the Californian firing distress rockets, 
and that this explains the perceived inaction of the Californian. Gardner's hypothesis is that the Californian was not expecting rockets, but a rendezvous. The ice on the deck of the Titanic is explained by Gardner as ice from the rigging of both the Titanic and the mystery ship she hit. As for the true Titanic, Gardner alleges that she spent 25 years in service as the Olympic and was scrapped in 1935. Simple reference to Board of Trade regulations of 1912 will confirm that rockets fired as they were from the Titanic, in intervals greater than one minute apart, did not signify distress. This being so, the Californian was completely correct in her inaction. The regulations were quite clear in specifying intervals of one minute or less, using rockets with a loud report, of any color, to signify distress. It would seem that a scheme to deliberately sink their ship would prompt White Star to make sure their captain and crew knew how to properly fire distress rockets. Neither demonstrated such knowledge during the sinking. Researchers Bruce Beveridge and Steve Hall took issue with many of Gardner's claims in their book, Olympic and Titanic, The Truth Behind the Conspiracy. Author Mark Chernside has also raised serious questions about the switch theory. Rumors that the two ships were switched in an elaborate insurance fraud have persisted for more than a century. The fact that J.P. Morgan who had booked the most luxurious suite on Titanic for her maiden voyage but cancelled at the last minute citing ill health, was found by reporters after the sinking at a French resort with his mistress only added to the speculation. Morgan died in his sleep the following year. Builders' documents affirm that a multitude of subtle differences in construction of the two ships make it improbable that a switch could have gone undetected. While few components bore the ship's names, most were cast or stamped with the builders' designated hull numbers, making a switch unlikely. Federal Reserve Several of Titanic's passengers including John Jacob Astor, Benjamin Guggenheim, Isaac Strauss, and George Dunton Widener were among the richest men in America. Some conspiracy theorists claim that these wealthy individuals were opposed to the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank and that financier J.P. Morgan saw the opportunity to eliminate them by convincing them to sail with him on the maiden voyage of the new Titanic which was really the badly damaged Olympic that he planned to sink in an insurance scam. As victims of a maritime disaster nobody would suspect that they had really been murdered to prevent them from opposing the Federal Reserve Act. In addition to Morgan, Several of his close friends and associates are known to have cancelled their plans to sail on Titanic at the last minute, as did the wife of J. Bruce Ismay. Morgan also had several bronze statues he had planned to transport to America removed from the ship a few hours before she sailed leading to speculation that he knew her fate. Mummy, the Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s Mummy curses in urban legend, possibly based on a priestess of Amun-Ra who lived in 1050 BC. According to legend, after the 1890s discovery of her mummy in Egypt, the purchaser of the mummy ran into serious misfortune. The mummy was then reportedly donated to the British Museum where it continued to cause mysterious problems for visitors and staff. The mummy was eventually purchased by journalist William Thomas Stead, who dismissed the claims of a curse as quirks of circumstance. The legend claims that he arranged for the mummy to be concealed on the underside of his calf for fear that it would not be taken aboard the Titanic because of its reputation. He reportedly revealed to other passengers the presence of the mummy the night before the accident. Official records state that the British Museum never received the mummy, only the lid of its sarcophagus. Additionally, except during war and special exhibits abroad, the lid has not left the Egyptian room. Closed watertight doors, another theory involves Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s watertight doors. This theory suggests that if these doors had been opened, the Titanic would have settled on an even keel and therefore, perhaps, remained afloat long enough for rescue ships to arrive. However, this theory appears to be far from reality for two reasons, first, there were no watertight doors between any of the first four compartments, Thus it was impossible to lower the concentration of water in the bow significantly. Second, Bedford and Hackett have shown by calculations that any significant amount of water aft of boiler room number 4 would have resulted in capsizing of the Titanic, which would have occurred about 30 minutes earlier than the actual time of sinking. Additionally, the lighting would have been lost about 70 minutes after the collision due to the flooding of the boiler rooms. 
Bedford and Hackett also analyzed the hypothetical case that there were no bulkheads at all. Then, the vessel would have capsized about 70 minutes before the actual time of sinking and lighting would have been lost about 40 minutes after the collision. Later, in a 1998 documentary titled Titanic, Secrets Revealed, the Discovery Channel ran model simulations which also rebut this theory. The simulations indicated that opening Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s watertight doors would have caused the ship to capsize earlier than she actually sank by more than one half hour, confirming the findings of Bedford and Hackett. Expansion Joints Theory Titanic researchers continue to debate the causes and mechanics of Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s breakup. In his 1955 book A Night to Remember, Walter Lord described Titanic as assuming an absolutely perpendicular position before its final plunge. This view remained largely unchallenged even after the wreck's discovery in 1985 confirmed that the ship had broken in two pieces at or near the surface. Paintings by noted marine artist Ken Marshall as well as James Cameron's 1997 film Titanic depicted the ship attaining a steep angle prior to the breakup. Most researchers acknowledged that Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s after expansion joined a Euro designed to allow for flexing of the hull in the seaway a Euro played little to no role in the ship's breakup, though debate continued as to whether the ship had broken from the top downwards or from the bottom upwards. In 2005, a History Channel expedition to the wreck site scrutinized two large sections of Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s keel which constituted the portion of the ship's bottom from immediately below the site of the break. With assistance from naval architect Roger Long, the team analyzed the wreckage and developed a new breakup scenario which was publicized in the 2006 television documentary Titanic's Final Moments, Missing Pieces. One hallmark of this new theory was the claim that Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s angle at the time of the breakup was far less than had been commonly assumed a Euro according to Long no greater than 11 a degree. Long also suspected that Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s breakup may have begun with the premature failure of the ships after expansion joint, and ultimately exacerbated the loss of life by causing Titanic to sink faster than anticipated. In 2006, the History Channel sponsored dives on Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s younger sister ship, Britannic which verified that the design of Britannic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s expansion joints was superior to that incorporated in the Titanic. To further explore Long's theory, the History Channel commissioned a new computer simulation by JMS Engineering. The simulation, whose results were featured in the 2007 documentary Titanic's Achilles Heel, partially refuted Long's suspicions by demonstrating that Titanic a Euro a Euro sh Euro s expansion joints were strong enough to deal with any and all stresses the ship could reasonably be expected to encounter in service and, during the sinking, actually outperformed their design specifications. But, most important is that the expansion joints were part of the superstructure, which was situated above the strength deck and therefore above the top of the structural hull girder. Thus, the expansion joints had no meaning for the support of the hull. He played no role in the breaking of the hull. They simply opened up and parted as the hull flexed or broke beneath them. Brad Matson's 2008 book Titanic's Last Secrets endorses the expansion joint theory. One common oversight is the fact that the collapse of the first funnel at a relatively shallow angle occurred when the forward expansion joint, over which several funnel stays crossed, opened as the hull was beginning to stress. The opening of the joint stretched and snapped the stays. The forward momentum of the ship as it took a sudden lurch forward and downward sent the unsupported funnel toppling onto the starboard bridge wing. One theory that would support the fracturing of the hull is that the Titanic partly grounded on the shelf of ice below the waterline as she collided with the iceberg, perhaps damaging the keel and underbelly. Later during the sinking, it was noticed that boiler room number 4 flooded from below the floor grates rather than from over the top of the watertight bulkhead. This would be consistent with additional damage along the keel compromising the integrity of the hull. Of course if Robin Gardner's theory is correct and the ship that sank was actually the Olympic which had allegedly been damaged beyond economic repair in her collision with the HMS Hawk the previous damage to the hull could certainly have played a role in the breakup. Norwegian submarine 
Some extreme Titanic theorists claim that the Titanic was destroyed by a Norwegian submarine, which fired a Thomas torpedo. They say this was done to collect on the insurance policy. The U-boat commander, who had agreed to take part in the plot, was reportedly related to one of the Titanic a Euro a Euro a Euro s owners. But this theory is not backed by any solid evidence. Both the passengers and the crew would have noticed a torpedo striking the ship. Furthermore, World War I, in which both Britain and Germany took part, would only begin two years later, in 1914. Most importantly, none of these conspiracy theories makes mention of the fact that Lloyds of London, who insured the White Star ships, would not grant a full coverage policy on either of the new giants. At the time, there were not enough underwriters to make such coverage feasible. Lloyd's records have long been readily available to the public. As a consequence, the insurance for both ships was only partial coverage, making such a scheme unlikely to yield benefit. References External links, Was there a fire aboard Titanic? CBC News